I received a comment on one of my videos regarding how long it took to learn how to manipulate a 3D camera in a game and that was a very interesting question and it made me think a little bit more about the challenge and the considerations behind the new player's experience and why this is something every designer needs to consider no matter what genre or gameplay loop they're intending to make. As the video game industry has become more popular and expanding the audience base for it, we're seeing more and more people join every day in terms of where their first game may be. And it's important from a design standpoint to always consider the new player's experience. Now when we use that term, we can refer to this in several different categories. We have somebody who's new to a specific game, somebody who's new to a specific genre, and somebody who's just completely new to video games at all. And while that last category is becoming fewer and fewer as more people are growing up with games, it's still important to consider how somebody brand new is going to approach your game. And this topic definitely calls back other discussions about playability, accessibility, and of course onboarding and tutorial design. But you must always consider what somebody brand new is going to look at in your game as this is very important when you're trying to figure out what are essential pain points and what are things that you can do with maybe explaining a little bit better or trying to improve the design around. Now when we talk about uh, we'll start with somebody new to a game in general. If you're somebody who's new to a game but is familiar with the genre that is where a lot of developers typically will build their games around. Because they assume that you already have some of the essential stuff already ingrained in your memory. How do I jump in a platformer? What is the reload button? How do I move and shoot in an FPS? And then it's up to you to have to explain what are the unique elements or unique selling points of your game? What makes your game different from all these other games who are the same genre? And this right here is essentially the bare minimum. If you can't explain to me why I should play your platformer instead of a Mario, Sonic, again, all the ones we played when I was doing research for my book, then what is the point of playing your game? And again, this is where onboarding and tutorial design come into play. Because this is where you need to explain to somebody what it is they're doing and why they can't just run around jumping on characters like in Mario. Now, when we talk about being new to a game or new to a genre, Nintendo has always been really great in this regard when it comes to onboarding and tutorial design. For expert players, I'm sure you're all tired of hearing the press A to jump command in a game again and again. But Nintendo has always done a great job of being able to explain their game in a way that is accessible to new players. Now, on to the second category of people who are new to a genre. This is something that it is a bit more rarer these days, especially so many games borrowing and taking elements from other popular franchises and genres. But you can still run into somebody who maybe Call of Duty is their first first-person shooter. Maybe Super Mario Odyssey is their first 3D platformer. And so on and so on. And again, a lot of this will always go back to the onboarding of your game. How do you get somebody to catch up with the design and what it is they're doing? And like we've said many times before, tutorial design is way too big to spend on a single video. And there's, very, uh, there's multiple aspects around it. But this is where a lot of developers tend to mess up on by the fact that they always assume that somebody playing a game has familiar knowledge of that genre. But as games are becoming more popular, as we're seeing more independent games start winning more noticeable awards, such as the Elysium this year, Celeste the year before that, you can't use the excuse of being small anymore when it comes to your onboarding. And again, just because somebody has played a game of that genre doesn't necessarily mean they actually understood it. Just because you've played Civilization doesn't mean something like Age of Wonders is going to come immediately to you 
or Stellaris or Europa Universalis. And as a developer, you need to always think about what somebody new is looking at with your game. Now again, understanding how far to go with streamlining or simplifying aspects, that's a completely different topic we can get into. Now, the third category, people who are brand new to games. This is kind of fascinating, because we're still seeing people slowly but surely try new games these days. And again, with the rise of the mobile and free-to-play market, that barrier of entry has been getting less and less. Now, of course, playing a free-to-play game is not the same as playing something like Dark Souls or Bloodborne, but it's just getting their foot in the door and then opening it up for future titles. But for our topic today, groups 2 and 3 tend to, I think, fall into that same kind of lessons in terms of onboarding and tutorial design. And it's very important from a design standpoint to be able to think about the new player experience when you're building your game. Because in the end, this is how you're going to approach the UI and the tutorial of your title. And oftentimes, this is the difference between the good games and the amazing ones. The ones that generally tend to win awards and are on everybody's best of list. Because they're very easy to learn and of course they're going to be harder or difficult to master. It shouldn't be difficult to learn. And as we've said many times before, difficulty and complexity are not the goals of a game. You want a game to be deep, but it can't. It doesn't have to be complicated. And we're kind of getting back to our safely extreme examples here. But with a lot of the games that we've played, especially with the slew of independent titles that we've seen on our spotlights these last few months, you can see the differences in terms of onboarding between them. Some games generally hold the player's hands and never let go. Other ones just throw you to the woods and say, okay, have fun, see if you can pick things up. And like we've said, you really want to avoid that especially if your game is a unique example of that genre. Survival games are a really good example of this. Each survival title has its own way of kind of sustaining yourself, gathering resources, what to focus on, and just because you played a game like Rust doesn't mean you're going to immediately follow Don't Starve, or The Long Dark, or Subnautica. And like we've said, you have to be able to explain to somebody what makes your game different. And those right there are some of the major aspects you need to touch on your tutorials. If your game features an unconventional UI or mechanics or a gameplay loop, I need to know what that is in order to even start to grasp what it is I'm trying to learn. And with that said, we're going to do our quick Patreon supporter and sponsor shout out. And when we return, we're going to take a look at a game that definitely did not follow that advice. And now a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. All Patreon supporters will now get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. Here we have footage of Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey. This was released in 2019, and I'm pretty sure most of you watching this video did not play this game. It kind of came and went very quickly in the market, and it's one of the most unique games we had a chance to play this year. It's also an example of perhaps one of the worst sets of onboarding I've seen in a game in some time. And there is a lot to unpack with Ancestors, and I still don't know even most of what this game is about. But I gave this game about three hours of trying to learn and figure out what it is I'm trying to do, and even then I barely made a dent in it. And this game commits a lot of game design sins. 
in terms of its approach. The first one is that the game makes use of an entirely unique context-sensitive UI. Everything that you do is going to be depend on whether or not you're holding items in your hands, you're moving, what time of day it is, your health, things like that. And right now what you're seeing is I'm trying to learn how to do crafting in this game. And crafting, like all the other systems, is completely unique to it. And the problem is that the game doesn't really explain or give you any hints at all as to what it is you're trying to do. What you're, in order to do crafting right here, you need to hold down the button until you hear an audio prompt to then let go to perform the necessary task. The problem is that the game does not tell you anything at all about how to perform these tasks. Now, I know somebody's going to comment and say, well, Josh, they want you to explore the mechanics and figure things out on your own. And that is perfectly fine, but you still need to give the player a basic set of functions and a toolbox, essentially, in order to be able to grow their mastery. This will be like having somebody who's never sat in a car before to figure out how to break it down, and also all the instructions are in a different language as well. Now, the game makes use of symbology in a lot of this discussion, or in a lot of these aspects, but again, doesn't reference or give you any idea what these symbols mean. That icon that you see above my character's head is supposed to represent a mo I'm sorry, a landmark. Every item, for instance, when you look at it, will give you symbols that relate to what functions it can serve. But again, outside of like simple things, such as, you know, Z's to represent maybe you could sleep with this or sleep on it, you're not really going to understand any of this just by looking at it. And the game gives you a lot of choices and a lot of aspects that they don't even tell you the basic controls for how they work. And the moment when I realized that this game is just not going to work from a design standpoint came near the end of the stream. I was trying to figure out what it is I was supposed to do with my tribe. And moving characters around, I figured out how I could basically gather a group of them and have them follow me. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad. But I didn't know what else I was supposed to do with them. And then as I was like playing around with the menus, I went to the help menu a few times, all of a sudden I saw a random alert, a random tip came up that said, hey, if you double tap B, while you have a group, they will mimic the action that you do, thereby allowing you to pick up like multiple copies of an item, do a task, and things like that. And right there is a very big problem, because that message was never revealed to me while I was playing the game with full tutorial prompts on. And this is a essential part of onboarding, that I need to know how to do the unique stuff in your game. Because if I can't follow that, how am I supposed to learn and grow from there? And this is just a bad way of designing a game, and it completely kills any sense of trying to figure things out. As a counterexample, because I know somebody will point out, what about complicated games? We can turn to something like Factorio. Factorio, at least at the last time I played it, didn't really have a full tutorial. It had like little tips and such, but of course they were still adding more elements to it. But that game kept things very organic in terms of its onboarding. It starts you off with just a very limited set of options that you can build. From there, you can start to figure out how things work in a microcosm before you try and start combining them. And so the player is essentially learning as they go, much like in Ancestors. However, Factorio is designed in a way that you're going to learn things in the order of their importance. The first thing you're going to do in Factorio is you're going to build like probably a basic engine. Then, or I'm sorry, you're going to mine stuff. Then you're going to take the stuff that you mine and you're going to turn that into a drill. You're then going to take what you've drilled, 
create a conveyor belt. You're going to then provide power to it. And then, lo and behold, you have a... a I forget. Oh, I'm going to forget the term off the top of my head right now. A, a perpet, there you go. Perpetually, uh, jet, perpetual motion device. It's going to power itself. And then from there, you can take those materials and start doing something else. And all this just keeps growing and growing, and you're essentially learning at your own pace. But with ancestors here, I am given information that may or not may or may not be relevant to what I'm trying to learn. I may be not given any information that's vitally important for survival. And I don't have a basic foundation in terms of learning this game. And because of that, any attempt at trying to say something or do something different is going to be lost. Because I am sure a lot of people bought this game played it for about maybe 15-20 minutes, got confused, maybe died or got penalized, and then said, I'm done with this game. I don't have the time to mess around with this. And that is the worst case scenario for failing the new player's experience. Because ultimately, this is why it's very important. Because new players are going to be potential fans to you and your game. And if you annoy somebody or they can't figure it out, you have potentially lost that fan for life. And as any independent developers know who's watching this, every fan of your game matters. And driving them away is not how you're going to build a successful game company. Although I guess if you want to be a polarizing and say hateful things, then yeah, maybe that will work, at least in the short run. But at the end of the day... If you want people to support you and follow you, you need to make sure they're able to follow and figure out what is going on. Like, here's another thing right here. The game tried to explain, or the only tip the game gave me was build a sleeping spot. It didn't tell me that I had to put the various items into a pile to then begin constructing them. And like I said, if I had the basic foundation of, let's say they just told me, in order to build something, put items in a pile, and then let me figure things out from there, I would be able to learn these things or learn this game and then grow. But here's the major point for today. The new player's experience is essentially the onboarding aspect, and it's something you should always think about as a developer. I don't care if you're making a simple match 3 game, the next Dark Souls style game, whatever we could describe Ancestors as, it doesn't matter. You always have to consider what somebody brand new is going to look and say about your game. And the games like we've said that turn out the best or get highly rewarded and praised typically are very welcoming to new players. They're easy to understand, they're easy to play, and then it just gets better from there. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to this rule. Nobody is going to say that Kerbal Space Program is an easy game to learn, and that game did incredibly well. But you can't just write off these like one-note exceptions or these exceptions to the rule and then not worry about yourself. For the indie devs watching this now, it is becoming a lot harder for games to stand out. Likewise, people are spending less time trying to learn a game. For instance, when I try to pick up uh, Rebel Outlaws or Rebel Galaxy Outlaws, I was immediately turned off by the fact that I am not a space sim guy. And at the moment, I didn't have the time to spend and try to learn a brand new genre from scratch. Now, I decided only to keep the game and supporting the developer, but I am, I think, an exception in this case. For a lot of people, when you have 20, 30 different games on your wish list, and one game is annoying you or is frustrating you, guess what? You can return that game and go to the next game in the list, and the next one. 
And while that's not a bad thing for the consumers, for developers looking to grow their fan base, like we've said, you've just lost potentially a fan for life if you don't think about this stuff. But with that said, thank you for watching this video. If there are any topics you want me to cover a little bit more in a later piece, let me know in the comments below. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where exam the art and science of games. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom we are examining the art and science of games.